your stake in the healthcare fight uh, so we can kind of ground ourselves in why we're here. So I let's do that and then in four minutes we're going to pull all the records back up yeah. here. Okay. Okay. Right. Go for it. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Medicare is going to cover the hearing screen. No. And she has AAL and that one Because I see, yeah, I see, yeah, yeah. And so one single payer, and she's 
nearly completely deaf in one ear. Probably down to like 50% in the other ear. If he had been that anymore. And, you know, this late in her life, in her 70s, she's not going to know sign language. She has, you know, she either has to have close to the teeth. He's not even sitting in it. Yeah, I mean, you know. So the good ear is close to the teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or she has to do some close captioning. It's, you know, it's available on the program that you sent what you're watching. But that's it. And that's why this industry is. And the gas is the real problem. Yeah, but the problem is you have to get something that can help it. Yeah, and I'm trying. The, I got a friend up in London, Ontario, and she can get new hearing aids like every two to three years. Yeah. So anyway, and she can do where, anything she wants with the old ones with the upset. And so she wants to send them to her mother, but I'm hoping that my, my mom can get an updated audiologist report that I can send it up to my friend with my mom's personal information that blacked out. Then, then my friend can take it to her audiologist and say, well, these hearing aids work for this person, and if they will, because they are tuner. And my mom would only have to get new ear molds, because my friend's ears will not match my mom's ears. And then, you know, if they would work, then my friend would send them now. I hope, I hope this can get worked out. You know, and I show, and I you know, one of my sisters uh, is kind of acting as my mom's advocate and one of the drivers because my mom doesn't drive either. Uh, you know, she, uh, I showed her the pictures of the hearing aids. So, uh, you know, hopefully, between my three sisters, to get my mom in, if my mom has to get an appointment with an audiologist to get uh, a new uh, evaluation. So that I can get it to my friend up in Canada. You will get it done. Yeah. Yeah. I want, I want to get it done. My friend wants to get it done. Because. Well, my reason for being yeah. here is because I am on this Yeah, and I was I have to do cancer, and I would not be able to get treatment if I didn't have the cancer. Yep, same with my dad, even though he died. So far, I'm doing very well. So that's really good. That's good. It's a little bit of television. Just being able to know I'm getting it. I need to have some dental work done and I can't get it because I can't get Medicaid. They say they are medically needy, but if you get into that, you have to pay out of pocket $650 a month. I don't rack up that much in medical bills a month. I mean, that's almost my rent. I, I, most of mine get paid until I have the cancer thing. That's my eyes and my eyes. And the insurance doesn't cover any of that. So I pay for all of that. I pay for it. And let me know why I don't do that. So that's my bad business. Yes. And trying to find a dentist that will accept that. Yeah. yeah. They deny them and they try to deny the vision, even though they said they're supposed to be. But then that thing, that idiot comes along. Alright, let's all come back together then now. That's wrapped up. Alright, thank you very much. Um, just a... Uh, um, Popcorn, I guess, as they say. Let's pop for a few responses. So why why are we here? What did you hear? What's our stake in this fight right now? Not everybody all at once. <laughs> Sherry. If pretty much every in other industrialized city or uh, country can do what we aren't able to do, we can have health care for every single citizen. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's fairly wrong. I heard that. Who 
Who else? just to have peace of mind for our care. One or two more folks? Stephen in the back, a little over here. Well, one thing is, uh, as a former president, he said he wished they had left the playing field. If there's a single pair, they're all in Florida, they have a level playing field. He wouldn't have to work for this guy, they wouldn't have insurance. It wouldn't matter. But again, maybe that's the reason. They don't want you to have it. And if they have a system, you might get leased, but you want you want to keep here anyway. Yeah. I hope we get enough um, points that we can argue persuasively to those people who think this isn't going to work. Because we're going to inform them that it is. That's All right. right. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of hard if, uh, unless you've turned off the TV and never pick up a newspaper and don't talk to your neighbors to, to know the state of healthcare in Iowa right now. It's, it's not good, right? That's right. Yeah, we've got skyrocketing premiums. If you're not have coverage through your employer, then go on the marketplace and go bankrupt pretty much the next hour. Um, you know, for folks that are dealing with, with Medicaid for this long-term services and, and supports population or those with permanent disabilities, they are living a crisis every day because we went and privatized our Medicaid, we threw everyone in one pool and for for-profit companies that aren't designed to provide care, they're designed to make a profit. So every day in the register and other papers, we see stories of care denied, services denied, delays, uh, sometimes even worse. Um, to make matters worse, I mean, you know, it's, it's so, so absurd, it's a little bit funny. I mean, we have a new Medicaid director. Anybody know who that guy is? Jerry Foxman. No, the Medicaid director. Mike Randall, who was the Medicaid director in Kansas. Huh. Oh, wow. so, so, again, unless you've been oblivious to the news, you know how that's been going in Kansas. So, I don't want to bring folks down, because this is an evening of bringing us up, bringing us together, and charging forward. But I do want to, I want to read you a quote um, by, some of you may know this name, uh, Milton Friedman. Uh, it's not a guy that I usually agree with his uh, ideals a lot, but he said something. He said, only a crisis real or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. Right. Sounds pretty spot on, doesn't it? Yep. So, I think we're gonna hear about such an idea, but then it is our job to keep talking about it, demanding it, until it becomes a politically inevitable. So, really happy to have Michael Leidy with National Arts United back out to Iowa for us. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you all. It's very great to see you, great to be back um, here uh, in Des Moines at, at uh, this incredible institution. This church is so devoted to social justice, so thank you for having me. And uh, Matthew's right. Don't let anyone tell you it can't happen. Because we are stronger than ever in this movement for guaranteed health care, Medicare for all, than we've ever been. Woo! Than we've ever been. National Nurses United is committed to winning this issue nationally. We've embarked on an even bigger national campaign to win Medicare for all. And Iowa is a key place where we're going to make that happen. Woo! Yeah! Uh, yeah. You all, you know this, you all set the table. And the reason that we are even talking about Medicare for All is because Senator Sanders put it on the national agenda. Right. Now we never underestimate the impact of having the, this nationally known, recognized, beloved figure devoted to this issue. But also never underestimate the movement that came after 2016 
that has continued this fight. So to the point where we have a bill in Iowa, House File 2352, Healthy Iowa. That's modeled on Healthy California, which was modeled on the New York Health Plan. There's a Healthy Florida, there's Healthy Maryland, there's gonna be Healthy Texas. So this is literally a groundswell. It's key state legislators all over the, legislatures all over the country. And we hear sometimes, well, you can't do single payer at the state level. Right? No, Vermont, what happened? Oh, no. <laughs> Let me tell you, this is not a time for can't. This is a time for will, and it's a time for political will. And we have to understand that this movement will not be determined by the one true perfect policy. I, uh, I, I sometimes get confused with Larry David. <laughs> so I thought, well, what would be more fun, because these flight attendants have come up to me, you're later than Larry David. No, I'm not. <laughs> yes, you are. You're Larry David. <laughs> All right, I'm Larry David. Uh, so I figured, well, what would be the funnest thing to do? Well, make my ringtone the theme for Curb Your Enthusiasm. <laughs> mess with my heads, right? <laughs> anyway, i got to turn off my phone. Um, so this movement, this movement, it is a political demand. It is a political demand that is operating at all levels, at the state level, at the federal level. This is what, this is what a movement looks like. There is not one true path. There are literally many ways to build this movement and nothing more crucial than Iowa. So what I'm gonna talk about today is I wanna talk just a quick overview of some of the key problems, analysis of the US healthcare system, a discussion of those principles of Medicare for All. We say approve Medicare for All, or Michael will be on my case. Uh, and, and then talk specifically about Healthy Iowa, just to, as an example of how we can do it uh, here. And it can happen here. So Elizabeth Rosenthal, one of the foremost uh, healthcare journalists in the country, she is the editor of uh, Kaiser, Kaiser Health News, which is produced by the Kaiser Family Foundation. She saw in her time as a journalist the transformation of healthcare from a caring endeavor to a medical industrial complex. Think of what that means. When you hear people say we need more market competition, when you hear people say that we need more private sector or free market ideals in healthcare, they have to understand that we already have that. We already have a market in healthcare where no one determines the price other than the company's ability to get whatever they want to charge. That's true for insurance companies, that's true for hospitals, that's true for drug companies, it's true for doctors. There is, some, there is no regulation of price in the healthcare system. That means that it is unregulated profit. It is a hugely profitable system that is, has made money, as Elizabeth Rosenthal says, the metric of all things. Imagine that if you're a registered nurse, we have some nurses in the house tonight, all right. Imagine, right, Barb, uh, as a registered nurse, you're told, oh, it's not the outcome or the quality of care you give. What's the bottom line? What's the impact on the budget for what you just did, right? You can't keep that patient in the hospital because the budget isn't there for it. You can't have that extra RN because the budget isn't there for it. You talk to any registered nurse in the system, and they will tell you, budget first. Money is the metric, and that, that set of values is directly contradictory to the kind of system we need. And in part, it's the reason why we don't deliver reliable results. Because we're paying for profit. We're paying for profit. Now look at this. This is very important because we often hear that, um, uh, well, if we just provide coverage with everybody, we can solve these problems. But we have to remember that insurance is not care. And in fact, the biggest crisis facing this country is the crisis of the insured. 36% of Americans have a deductible of $2,000 or more. <clears throat> Nearly a majority of Americans doesn't have $1,000 in the bank. An ambulance ride generally costs $2,000 or more. Do the math. We don't have enough money to guarantee that we'll get the health care we need because the system has erected these financial barriers to care, even when you have insurance. Similarly, what we talk about this um, approach to provide tax subsidies for the purchase of insurance, you're subsidizing a model that is based on the denial of care. 
And that denial goes directly to the fact that we're not getting the health care we need and it wastes taxpayers' money. Often we're saying, hey, well, we just need to provide more subsidies for people because health care is so expensive. Let's have taxpayers subsidize the purchase of health care. But it makes no sense to ask people who already can't afford health care to pay more for others. That's not a winning political approach to solving the problem. Underfunding, and you all know this, underfunding of Medicaid and the privatization of Medicaid in Iowa has been a disaster, right? Yeah. And it's precisely, that's the market. Those are, you know, those are the market values. Going from 8% administration costs to 23%. Right, 8% under regular Medicaid, 23% under uh, MCO. And so we underfund it, and naturally, it doesn't provide the standard of care that actually heals people. And then when you talk about what's really necessary to try to achieve universal coverage, and pretty soon you find yourself confronting the same obstacles to doing a single payer improved Medicare for all. So what's the point? The point is we have an analysis that points the way. Look at this. $342 billion in tax subsidies to employers to buy private insurance. Does that sound like a winning business model? <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, my business is profitable if the government gives me $340 billion. That's the health insurance industry. The average and large employers have the lowest premiums. Their average is $14,000 a year. And then on top of that, workers are paying $4,400. It's simply not sustainable at that level of expense. You look at some of this, and that's why I talked about the 36% of Americans are underinsured with a greater deductible. You can get a tax break, a tax subsidy for almost $7,000, but you're still stuck with almost $4,500 in out-of-pocket costs. So there's basically two ways out of the system. You can try to subsidize your way to some version of universal coverage, or you can actually achieve the efficiencies of an improved Medicare for all system, and that's what we'll talk about, the difference. In general, people are satisfied with their health care until they really need it. <laughs> right? Hey, my insurance is great. Oh, have you gone to the doctor this year? No, no, I never go to the doctor. <laughs> well, wait till you go to the hospital, right? Um, and so we, there is this kind of sense that, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. But then when you dig down, you find out this huge level of anxiety. Is the doctor going to be in the network? Am I, am I going to be able to afford the care that I need? What if my premiums go up? What about the escalating co-pays and premiums I have to pay? Employers have saved money. Employers, yes, the cost of health insurance has skyrocketed. But employers used to pay the whole cost. And now they pay less and less, and the costs go to the workers. So generally, the amount the employers are able to uh, kind of um, stabilize the impact of increasing healthcare costs by shifting it to workers. And that's what's going on. And people are worried about it. Will they really be able to go to a doctor without paying more? And the answer in this, in this system is no. And what's remarkable to me about this chart is this difference between 2015 and 2017. 43% saying that the deductible you pay makes it difficult for you to get the care you need. 43%. I often hear from folks, oh, there's all this aversion to changing. There's all this fear of giving up the health plan that they have. And I don't understand it. I, you know, I, I, when I look at these numbers, I really don't. And it's, it's very <clears throat> difficult. Simple things, a copay for a doctor's visit. We've heard that the Affordable Care Act was gonna solve the problem of people going to the emergency room when it wasn't a true emergency but it hasn't solved that problem. We're still having excessive emergency room use. Why is that? Because when you go to the ER, there's no copay up front. Now there's $10,000 on the back end, but you couldn't pay 50, so 10,000 is like, well, that's ridiculous. I'm never gonna pay that. But if you go to the doctor, they won't see you unless you pay the 50. Whereas in the ER, you can get stabilized and treated without paying anything. So it doesn't solve the problem to give folks insurance, even if it's subsidized. If they have a copay they can't afford, they're not getting the care they need. And that's the essence of today's crisis, right there. Now, the other thing about the private insurance model, as we mentioned, I mean, they're denied about 200 million claims a year. Their business model depends on two things, 
your tax dollars and their ability to deny care. Yeah, I mean, if money is the metric of everything, then you're not concerned about outcomes, you're not concerned about quality of care, you're just concerned about making sure that you don't pay more in claims than you bring in in premiums. That's the business model. And getting a tax subsidy to make sure you have enough cushion to make a profit. But if you deny 200 million claims a year, there's a lot of people going without health care. And it's inherent in the model. It's inherent in the model. And um, we read in the, uh, in the California papers about the Edna medical director. You can see this. Oh, the medical director was asked in a deposition, well, you denied this claim. Uh, can you tell us about the basis for your decision? Oh, I didn't read that. I didn't read their medical history. I didn't read their claim. I actually don't even, I don't even really understand that disease because I'm not a specialist in that disease. But you denied the claim. Well, yes, I did. And that's typical. You've got medical doctors who don't really even know the condition they're evaluating, just deny, just deny the claim. And in that case, uh, uh, they were able to litigate it. That's difficult to do. But keep in mind what the result is. Look at this profit level. Their annual company profit, United Healthcare is big here uh, in Iowa, and uh, they're doing pretty well. They, they were doing pretty well through 2015. And then you know who's doing especially the CEO, who knew? <laughs> Helmsley, $66 million in one year, 2016. 22 million, 28 million, I mean, this is outrageous. This is outrageous. Because if money is the metric of all things in healthcare, then if you see the relationship between these two charts, okay, profits up, pay up. It's success. And that is the definition of success in the current healthcare system. But in that healthcare system, prices are unregulated. As we mentioned, this is just an illustration of the prescription drug prices, simply because we like to know that we're subsidizing the United Kingdom. Um, uh, they pay three times less than we do, and we have uh, the highest price drugs in 13 out of 14 cases. That's just an illustration. So what's the alternative? In a situation where drugs, price of drugs is unregulated, where insurers can charge everything that they want, courtesy of the taxpayers. Hospitals are encouraged to merge and consolidate so they have a market share. So what you have is essentially a war among all these people. The drug companies versus the insurers, the insurers versus the hospitals, the hospitals versus the drug companies. What it, what it results in is all those players getting more and more revenue, not the prices are held in check because they're, they're basically consolidating developing their market power to increase their revenues, not to take care of patients. So what we have to do is we have to disrupt that whole process by taking the financing out of the profit mill. We have to make the financing public. 62%, as you'll see in Iowa, 62.5% of healthcare spending today in Iowa comes from taxes. In California, that number is 70. Nationally, that number is about 60. We have a publicly funded system. We're not getting our money's worth because the public monies are going to the bottom line of the healthcare corporations. We can replace premiums with progressive financing, and right there, that's the, when you talk about single payer, that's it right there on the financing side. No more insurance premiums, deductibles, or co-pays. We can pay that through taxes, and then we put everybody, no cost to access care when you need it. What does the health and wellness program in Iowa tell us? Those who have the most chronic conditions need to be in a program where there's no financial barriers to care. Two thirds of Americans have two or more chronic conditions by age 65. We all need that health and wellness, no barriers to care program. That's, that's the bottom line. Comprehensive benefits not based on premium cost. Every ER doctor you talk to who runs an ER will tell you, it's not just that you get different benefits from different insurance plans, you get a different standard of care. You get different treatments, you get access to different drugs, you get access to different technologies, you get access to different specialists based on how good your health plan is. So the alternative has to be a single standard of safe therapeutic care for everybody. But that means you gotta be able to go to doctors. They can't limit your network. 
Because the way that they save money is by limiting your network so that if you go outside that network, you pay more and they're off the hook. That's what narrow networks do. And of course, as I mentioned, the Balanced Budget Act of the mid-90s encouraged hospitals to consolidate. If you analyze the contemporary uh, global economy, there's a huge emphasis on monopoly market power, where businesses are essentially trying to capture as much of a market to create monopoly pricing power as possible, and healthcare is on steroids in that respect. Angus Deaton, the Nobel Prize winning economist from 2015, said that healthcare is the worst example of crony capitalism and the driver of inequality. I heard that. Because so much of the healthcare spending benefits uh, disproportionately the wealthy. Okay, I lost that slide. I wonder what that was. Uh, so here's, here's the financing mechanisms. Progressive taxation on individuals and businesses. Price controls, that's a heavy word, price controls. But it's what other countries do. And that's what, it's a, it's a rate setting negotiation. It's a process of saying, okay, we'll buy, this is what the Veterans Administration does. We'll buy this set of drugs, our primary, what they call formulary, and you'll give us a very big discount on those drugs because we're gonna use those a lot. And that's you basically work it out. That's how other countries have done it. We think that can save as much as 30% on drug prices. Similarly, you eliminate, of course, insurance rates because the insurance companies no longer provide benefits. The four benefits are provided through the new Healthy Iowa program, in this case, or uh, Medicare improved at the federal level. And then we negotiate the fees and payments for providers. Basically, if you go to Medicare rates, you can save about 22% from what commercial insurance. And if you eliminate all the billing and administrative costs, doctors can come out about even, because they don't have to pay all that to the uh, administrator of the claims. If you pay the reimbursement rates a little bit lower, but if you, if you then also raise the Medicaid rates, very key question for Iowa, how can we raise Medicaid rates in Iowa so that doctors will take Medicaid patients? Well, two choices, raise taxes on those with insurance, or do single payer because there's no other way to, to get the money for that huge advantage here so let's talk a little bit about the healthy Iowa Act this uh, this is pretty exciting because I mean let's face it we're in a position we're in a position in November if the Democrats take the house to have a real fight in the House of Representatives on Medicare for All. A majority of the Democratic caucus is on H.R. 676, Improved Medicare for All. You know, there's like uh, 16 senators now on S1804. If the Dems take the House in November, we're gonna claim that as a mandate to do Improved Medicare for All. And then we're gonna be in the House, and Pete is gonna be in the House, and he's gonna be voting on that. And we're going to be in a position to Demand that Democrats take a stand. Take a stand, Democrats. And there is no more state, no more important state than Iowa. So we have this opportunity. We've got this, this growing national movement for Medicare for All. We've got a registered nurse running for governor in Iowa. <laughs> running on a single payer improved Medicare for All. And then we know where the first in the nation caucuses are gonna be in February of 2020. Right. Add that up, and this is the heart of this political movement that is gonna win Medicare for All. But we also wanna to relate to what's going on here in the state. So we wanna develop a policy and an organizing opportunity around this state bill. Now the key provisions of Healthy Iowa are gonna sound very familiar because they're the key provisions of what Medicare and improved Medicare for All would look like. Doctors, nurses, and clinicians in charge of healthcare services. Who's heard of the Bezos, Buffett, Diamond, great new company, right? Well, what's remarkable about that, we were talking about this earlier, and what's remarkable about Apple computers saying, okay, we're just gonna directly contract with providers. And then the United States of Care, another uh, kind of uh, private public partnership on health policy, is saying the financial barriers to care are too high. We've gotta come up with another way of providing care other than insurance. Think of that for a second. Corporate America has given up on health insurance as a solution to the healthcare crisis. Corporate America has given up on health insurance as a solution. 
The ACA was the last, really seen as if we can't make this work, we don't know how to make it work. So what they're doing at, at uh, Bezos and company is they're creating a new entity that's going to directly provide care. They're not going to have an insurance company. Apple's going to directly contract. This is a remarkable moment. Because now we really have a, uh, really a choice. Because we're either going to be on our own, and maybe our employer will help us buy an individual plan, or we'll buy the family plan. Maybe we'll get a tax subsidy to buy a plan on the exchange. Maybe we'll be in Medicare so that 60% of our costs will be covered. Because seniors by the year 2030 are looking at 40% of their medical costs out of pocket under a recent study. So that's on your own health care with a little help. Or we can put everybody in one pool, save the money, and guarantee health care. Because we're all in this together. And so it ultimately is a moral question. It's a moral question. Is healthcare a common good, a human right? Or is it a privilege and a commodity that you just get enough based on your ability to pay? And the level of anxiety that Americans take for granted, the amount of crap that we have to do to get healthcare, and we just say, well, that's just the way it is. Of course we've got to investigate these plans and figure out if our doctor's in it. Of course we've got to decide whether a premium of 400 a month is better than a premium of 300 a month with a deductible of 1,000 versus a deductible yeah. of 500. <laughs> right? Insane. I mean, that's, that's like just expected. But nobody else does that in industrialized, highly industrialized countries. They just don't have that level of anxiety. It doesn't exist. So what we really ultimately are offering here is peace of mind when it comes to healthcare. And as long as you're dealing with an insurance company, you're not going to have that peace of mind. But if we can guarantee let's get to all residents, we go to the doctor of our choice, we have clinicians in charge, we replace the insurance company role with a transparent, accountable public system, then we can get the care we need. That's the premise here. And the benefits are comprehensive. Um, and that's something that's a problem with existing Medicare. It doesn't include oral health or vision, for example. This would. This would occur, include long-term uh, LTSS services. It would include 100 days of um, the SNF skill nursing facility. Ultimately, it would include workers' comp and would incorporate retiree health benefits. So the idea is to make it as comprehensive as possible. There are two ways to go when you design these systems. You can create a, you know, a core benefit that's relatively, that's good, but not broad. ACA did that, pretty good. Or you can try to make the benefits as comprehensive as possible to create equity and shrink the role of the private insurers, and that's what this proposal does. Here's a table, maybe a little difficult to read. Um, this is just, I wanted to give you an overall sense of where the money goes now, uh, from where, in, in Iowa. So you're looking at um, Medicare uh, is, is the largest uh, single uh, percentage of, of revenue in the system. Uh, broken down, Medicaid is, is um, right up there. Uh, the federal share is obviously more than the, the state, 10.5 to 6.0%. And then you look at the other government contributions, and then you look at the tax subsidies. These are pretty substantial tax subsidies, uh, over uh, almost 12%, really effectively 12%. Subsidies. So 12% of the money coming into Iowa are in the form of subsidies from um, uh, from all levels of government. And you've also got a, um, you devote some of the general fund revenue to a sales tax exemption for the for the um, uh, medical uh, costs. So that ends up being about, as I said, 62.5%. That's a lot of public money into a system that we're told is privately financed. We're told we have a privately financed system, but we don't here in Iowa. And when we looked at it, it's like, well, okay, how do you, it's all a great idea, how are you gonna pay for it? Well, it turns out, it turns out that if you cover everyone in Iowa, in the present system, through private insurance with all the co-pays and everything, you're gonna spend around 35, 36 billion to do that. But if you go to Healthy Iowa, you can actually get that number down to 28 and a half billion. Because you eliminate all the fragmentation and the administrative waste and inefficiency, we estimate 
that you can save 18% in system with a very conservative approach to estimating those savings. Some delivery system efficiencies eliminate the profits and marketing costs and administrative billing for hospitals and insurance and doctor's office. You can, you can achieve that savings. If we then look at what portion from existing public sources, that's about that 17.8 billion, we have to raise about 10.7 billion to replace the monies we're currently spending through private, through employers or individuals by billing. And that's where, you can, there are a number of ways to do it. What we're doing with Healthy Iowa is saying, here's the program, here's how you can save money if you do these things. Control prices, save on administration, improve efficiency and fragmentation. There are different ways to raise that revenue. Maybe it's a payroll tax. Maybe it's a gross receipts tax. Many states have that on the revenues of the business. Maybe it's a sales tax. Here's the bottom line. Every way you cut it and slice and dice it, people save tons of money. Middle class families save between eight and 13%. Businesses, we have, a, we have with this financing plan, Here's some examples of the money that people can save. Low-income folks who really are on Medicaid don't have high out-of-pocket expenses. They do not have a high standard of care, but they do not have high expenses. We can keep that the same or reduce it a little bit. It's really in the middle-income families where the difference is extensive. You basically, under the ACA, got a 9.6% cap on how much out-of-pocket you're supposed to spend. We can, get, we can reduce that a tenth tenth of that through this program. We can reduce, the uh, even for high income families who are gonna pay more, they actually get a real deal in the present system, a great deal. They're not gonna get as good a deal. So their costs are gonna go up slightly, around 1%. But look at these savings for middle income families. And don't take, in the dynamic, when you talk to folks about healthcare, you very quickly hear people complaining that others are getting a subsidy but not me. You had those conversations? There's a huge level of resentment. This ends this. You want an argument to your uh, you know, Republican voting friends in rural Iowa? This has got something for you too. This isn't for others, this is for you. This is for all of us, because we're all in this together. This is not guaranteed healthcare for some and subsidies for some. This is all of us contributing and all of us benefiting. In a mixed system, Privately delivered, publicly financed. This is not some radical reform. This is simply the most efficient and humane way to deliver healthcare. And it really shouldn't be a partisan issue. It really shouldn't be. And workers will benefit. 52% of Trump voters who make under $30,000 a year support a federal guarantee of healthcare. This is a conversation we can have in rural Iowa with red voters. We can have this conversation. And who has the most to gain from lowering healthcare costs and containing those costs? Going from like, our present system is about 32 billion, we can go down from that to 28.5, and the present one doesn't cover everybody. Who benefits from that extra two billion, or billion, or four billion, six billion? Education, jobs. And because the ripple effect of this program is to create money throughout the system and ultimately to increase tax revenues for government because people are more productive. They can change jobs. They can start new businesses. If a, a see in the business for the businesses, the, um, the reduction is um, substantial. Uh, that's the labor. For business, this, say we institute a payroll tax for to fund Healthy Iowa. We can exempt 80% of Iowa businesses. 80% of Iowa businesses who have payrolls under 200,000 or gross receipts under, under 2 million wouldn't pay a dime. And those are most of the businesses that aren't providing insurance now because they can't afford it. Imagine if they have a healthy workforce and they have resources devoted to investment and growth. You could become an entrepreneur because you're not tied to your job. You've generated new tax revenues. You've saved the state budget billions so you have money for education. This is not just about healthcare. This is about transforming our society in a humane way that is also completely consistent with ideals of accountability and efficiency. And these really, controlling healthcare costs means real value for business. This is not a political partisan argument. This is a bottom line argument. Why are you giving 
20% on the dollar to a health insurance company that has no value to your bottom line. And the richest guy in the world has figured out, not a good deal, I'm going to do something else. Because Jeff Bezos, if he believed in private insurance, he wouldn't be starting that company. If he thought private insurance was going to work, he wouldn't have started that company. Now, one might ask, setting up uh, a company, somebody's going to determine what kind of health care we get. Our bias is we'd rather have doctors and nurses than CEOs make that determination. Or legislators. But that's a fight. That's a fight. Right? And what we do with Healthy Iowa is we have an independent board. Yes, it's appointed by the governor and the legislature, but ultimately accountable to the people. And ultimately with clinicians in charge of health care and not bureaucrats. What we, uh, for labor, of course, it's, it's an extraordinary benefit. It's really, it's really a program of liberation. And ultimately, I, we started this discussion about, well, you can't do this, you can't do that, you've got to get the right policy. Ultimately, this is about our life and our livelihood. It's about our own economic self-interest as workers. Can we provide for ourselves and our family? Can we have security when it comes to health care? Can we create a society that has the resources to create a common good and a common wealth that we actually want to live in and can survive in? And health care in this fight is a portal to all of that. And so this rising movement for improved Medicare for all tells us we can transform this society. And the role that we can play in Iowa is fundamental and crucial. <clears throat> so that's our opportunity, and I'm so glad that we're here to talk about this and to engage in this. Because I'll tell you this, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and the sooner we get to work, the sooner it will happen. Thank you very much. So I'd love to take some questions, get into this. Uh, Michael? Thank you, Michael. Uh, great presentation. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a moment and suggest to you that um, big pharma and insurance companies spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on lobbying efforts in Washington. Um, I would suggest that perhaps this is all fine and good, but it may take more than just conversation with elected officials or people who wish to be elected officials. And has this come to the point of civil disobedience? Well, probably. <laughs> to be honest with you, I mean, there's, look at, if we, you know, there's a desire to um, engage industrial action, right? To say, like, in California, we're contract bargaining with Kaiser. That's the largest HMO in the country. They cover about eight and a half million members in California. They make a billion dollars in net income every quarter. A billion dollars. They're the biggest opponent, just as you say. So there's a real desire to confront them directly. And I think that's where it's going. I don't think we're there yet. And we're not, but really what we're talking about is building a mass movement that so transformed public opinion that it becomes irresistible. And that's what, you know, and, and the civil rights movement is a model. And the fact that Medicare was um, adopted in 65 at the height of the civil rights movement is not a coincidence. The fact that Medicare desegregated hospitals is not a coincidence. And that's the, we're not going to win this. That's the other piece of it. We're not going to win this, and people are still going to make 725 an hour. Right? I mean, this is part of a broad justice demand, just like Medicare was in the civil rights movement. I think that's really what it takes. Well, first of all, keep in mind that the insurance companies do function as administrators in Medicare. So, for example, just to process and pay claims, they carry out that function. It's the um, actuarial risk determination, rate setting, insurance function that we're eliminating. There still will very likely be, just like when you went from Medicaid to MCO, many of those workers had to transfer from the public program to the new private entity. Very similar to that, although with a better result. Yeah. It's probably not going to be all those people. But it won't be, you're right, because how do we save money? We save money by eliminating jobs. Right. 
And so we're going to quantify that exactly. We've done some initial work at the federal level and in California, we're applying that same model to Iowa. We're gonna come up with an estimate of the jobs affected, well, how attrition will then you know, relieve some of the need for job training, how job placement will relieve it, and then what we, what we need then to fund as a retraining. Can we put those people in clinical jobs, for example? And, and we estimate that that's gonna take one to one and a half percent of total system funding for the first three years. So that's, and so it's real. And in a state like Iowa, where there's a lot of insurance company um, workers, we know it's real. And we have to address that head on. And we will through, through this transition. But ultimately, we're going to have people not denying care, but providing care. And that's going to be better. How will this system affect people in nursing homes where they're, they're paying you know, $4,400 a month for their care and medication? So how is this well, we think there are a couple of benefits. Long-term care overall will, um, is slated to be integrated in the system within two years. So it's not up front in the system because it is financed differently and is complex in terms of uh, implementing it. So we've given ourselves some more time to do that. Once it's fully integrated, we think it's an opportunity to both fund the institutional care programs, but also provide resources to incentivize home-based and community-based care. Because the problem in the present system, as you know, under Medicaid in particular, there's too greater emphasis on nursing homes and not enough support for keeping people in their homes. And just because of the way you know federal policy is, is stuck, basically, in an old mode. So we think there is possibility for innovation there, but everyone would be covered by that, uh, by this new program. And um, so, because we can't get a Medicaid waiver through 1115, um, Although I must say that it came out today that the Trump administration hasn't certified that the waivers they've given have improved anything or saved any money. So they're just letting it happen, not knowing what the impact is. Who knew? But um, <laughs> we could have guessed. So anyway, I think there is an opportunity to get the waiver to consolidate those services as part of this program and fund them uh, more efficiently and probably incentivize better settings, you know, more appropriate settings. Yeah, in about two years. After the program's implemented. Uh, since I was, I think, the second or third biggest insurance place in the United States, I think I'm right. Yes. Uh, how was that going to affect, I heard you said, but how does that affect Iowa people because of that, regarding right. that? Well, it's not going to have a disproportionate effect on Iowa, we don't believe, because we're going to provide the resources to make sure that those folks are taken care of. <coughs> and that the transition um, happens um, in a way that, that preserves their uh, economic status. But it is true that insurance companies may take a particular umbrage at us going after their, uh, <laughs> their business. I'll tell you this though, health insurance is not a great business line. Health insurance is not a great business line compared to other types of insurance, so there's also that. Well, yeah, it, you know, um, so, we think that there is a role for the insurance company, supplemental benefits and claims administration. We think we can transition the jobs effectively so no one suffers economically. And we think that given the opportunity, those companies may find the more profitable business lines. Now, that's not gonna make it easy. We get that. Because anytime you're dealing with jobs and profits, you get the legislature very, very nervous, right? But there's a business case to be made for this. And, it's, and ultimately, I think that's going to be decisive. Because if other businesses say, like Jeff Bezos, like Apple Computer, sorry guys, the insurance just isn't part of the solution, then I think it tips it over. I think business is crucial to that. Uh, my, my question is, uh, is actually Ted's question, but he's too shy. <laughs> well, when are you writing your book? <laughs> I don't have time. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. you mentioned small businesses that yeah. pay lower for people for large families. How would this work for them? <laughs> well, <laughs> the question was, hey, you said that you're going to exempt small business, you know, uh, with payrolls of less than 200,000, so how's that going to work? 
Well, basically how it's going to work, we do envision no, no. Um, a sales tax as part of this financing. The sales tax would exempt home and uh, home housing costs and food at home and utilities and provide a rebate to low-income folks so it's not regressive. But small businesses would have to collect it. That is a sales tax, they'd have to collect it at the point of sale. Otherwise, they would have a healthy workforce with no impact on their bottom line. So those who are providing insurance now, if you're a small business and you provide insurance, you're probably spending about 22% of payroll. Now there aren't that many you do, but imagine getting 22% added to your bottom line. That's how it would work for those companies. For those companies who currently aren't providing health care because they can't afford it, they would now have be able to have a healthy workforce and probably less turnover because workers are not looking for a job that provides health care, right? or they're not coming home to work sick. So it's going to have a great impact on those small businesses because it will relieve any burden they currently have, any anxiety they have, and improve productivity in terms of the workers that they're able to, to train and keep. So we think it's very, and that's why we think ultimately, from, from a business point of view, there's no prospect of small businesses ever being able to afford private insurance. Well, I know a young man who currently is running a small But what he told me when I mentioned to him the Bernie Sanders plan, 36% for tax, and he said, how come this always comes back on employers? So I said, John, how many people work for you? And he said, oh, it's just me at this time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a newsflash. You're not an employer if you're not employing anyone but yourself. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. Um, uh, yeah, no, it's, and, and even Senator Sanders' bill, I think, um, would, they wouldn't necessarily, not all businesses would have to pay that 6%, so I think there is, there is an exemption there. But yeah, for the, for the self-employed, though, it's a great deal, because uh, you don't have to pay 2000 a month, right, for a family plan, and you can be an entrepreneur, and not say, well, I gotta stick to my, you know, restaurant job, and not do my film, because I need health insurance. So I think it's a huge. Yes. Uh, question about the status in California. So kind of a two-part question. Where is it in California right now? And also, do you really see this going state by state or more well, overall across country? I don't see it going state by state. What I see is a big state like California combined with a pivotal small state like Iowa can set the table just like Massachusetts did Romney Care, with Romney Care. That's what I see. And I see the sixth largest economy in the world, controlled by Democrats, as the most likely place for it to happen. Now, um, the Speaker of the Assembly disagreed. He, he stalled the bill in the Assembly Rules Committee. It's called suspense. And frankly, those uh, we just learned of a bill that's been in suspense like that for four years across two sessions. That's not going to happen here. But we're in this political fight. We've done grassroots organizing in 80, all 80 assembly districts. We were at the Democratic Party convention this past weekend, or two weekends ago in San Diego, and that was, I'll tell you, I'll just use the word, it was the litmus test. If you were for 562, the single payer bill, you were progressive, and if you weren't, you weren't. The gubernatorial candidate who wasn't for it? Now think of this, former mayor of LA, former speaker of the assembly, Arguably the most prominent Latino politician of his generation got 9% of the vote at the California Democratic Party convention because he opposes our single payer. The front runner for governor, the Democrat Gavin Newsom, is running on the bill, is running in support of the bill. So what may look on one hand like, oh, the political will is stalled, the leadership's not for it, did just vary slightly, and you find actually the groundswell is growing, the leadership, you know, the most dynamic leadership. There is a sitting senator in California who is a Democrat who got 37% of the vote at her own party's convention. Because she doesn't support improved Medicare for all. Who's so, that? Diane Feinstein. <laughs> Diane Feinstein. Who, who got 57% of the vote? The guy that President Pro Tem of the California Senate who moved our bill. So that political dynamic is not what you hear, 
But that's much more the reality. And I'm not saying every Democrat's like a liberal party activist who goes to the convention. I mean, we all know a little bit about that difference, I think, here. But it still re is re reflected. 58% of Californians, even after they hear about taxes, support this bill. So we think the political momentum is actually still building. But that's where it's at. Well, the Medicare tax isn't capped. Social Security tax okay. is. Um, See, I've never made that kind of money, so I didn't know. <laughs> um, but you're right. At the Fed, this is, I'll tell you this, this is a lot easier at the federal level. This is a lot easier as policy at the federal level. I think Michael might be right. It might be harder in some respects uh, politically at the federal level. But as policy, it's a lot easier. You can double the Medicare payroll tax. Throw in maybe a, a tax on Wall Street trades, some kind of upper income tax, maybe reverse some of the you know tax cuts. Boom, you're done. Yeah. Right, you got it. So, uh, in that sense, you can imagine. Um, on the other hand, you know we're fighting you know uh, an industry that has three lobbyists for every member of Congress. So we, we confront that, right? But you've got the majority of the Democrat caucus for HR 676. So uh, we think the House is a place where we can have this fight and get right to those issues. And so it's, it's like a symbiotic thing. It's not going state to state to state, but it's creating the political momentum, the movement. So there's not, it's a false distinction to say, oh, well, you can't do single payer in a state, so you shouldn't do it. No. People want to know that we have a solution to the Medicaid crisis. The Republicans are just against health care. Oh, we're against Obamacare. We're against, you know, the way Medicaid was. We're against Medicare. We're going to take trillion four out of Medicaid. And establishment Dems are like, well, we're against what the Republicans are doing, and we're against this big change in Medicare for all, so let's just tweak the system. Well, it turns out we're dealing with people who are for something. We're for health care for all. We're for guaranteed health care. And that's what motivates people. And it's not about the policy perfection. It's about motivating people to get our needs met because we've been screwed by the system. That's ultimately what it comes down to. Well, yeah, the best stuff we have, the shortest, most concise stuff is what we headed out tonight. Um, you can go to the um, uh, NEU website and you can dig deep if you want to. Um, I'm just but, thinking about getting it out to people who aren't here today. No, exactly. And we're going to develop more. We, we have to develop more. But these opening flyers are pretty good. Pretty good summaries. Yes. No, no. Uh, uh, Bernie doesn't have a financing plan. The same, the same people. We, uh, we hired um, Robert Poland, who's a professor at UMass Amherst, yeah, who runs the Political Economy Research Institute there, to study Healthy California. We then took that model of analysis and applied it to Healthy Iowa. And that's where we got the numbers, and that's the analysis. And you can see the underlying study at nmu.org, nationalnursesunited.org, has the full and study. You can Google it. But, and, and so it, what it does is essentially analyzes through the existing data what a state, you can quantify what a state spends on health care as personal health care expenses, public health care expenses, and so forth. And that's what we did. And then you can create that number that says, okay, let's capture all that public money. What's left over after we eliminate the insurance company premiums, deductibles, and co-pays that employers and individuals pay, what do we need to raise? And that's where we got the 10.7 billion figure and uh, then those tax options that are the way to get there. That's essentially how it's out there. Yes. Yeah, that's a tough one, right? Because the question is, well, gee, there's got to be some hospitals that are better than others, or doctors more effective, right? 
But right now we have a system where you can't do that because it's very hard to evaluate quality or compare quality. So it's a risk we all have. No, I don't think that's true. I think that, that what we're going to, I think if we can change the financing of the system, then those differences around quality and practice reveal themselves. And we're really in a position to know what the differences are in terms of uh, outcomes, right, and quality of care. But you talk, you go, you talk to these policy wonks, and they'll, many of them will assert, oh, we, we can measure quality. But the latest research shows that's very, very difficult to do. Because, and this is really the, at the heart of this of the problem. When you talk about the models of healthcare, you're talking about population studies. What's good overall for someone with, say, an underlying coronary disease? What's the average? What's the you know standard approach that will be most effective for most people? But that's not how healthcare works. Healthcare is the most individual experience of our lives. So you can't really determine what's going to work for you based on what generally works for most people. And we've got to create a system where your individual doctor has the time and the incentive to figure out what's wrong with you and develop a practice plan for you without wasting money, wasting time, and getting denied by an insurance company. So that's how we get to the quality issues ultimately, is creating a system where you can evaluate practice patterns overall because everybody's in one system, and you can emphasize the professional clinical judgment of providers. That's what we're trying to get to. Sorry, I went a little deep there on the RN. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. But that's really, really, that's what we're talking about. Is your doctor or nurse going to be able to give you the care you need? And that's what we can achieve. So thank you. Can we go to the car? We might bring it back up for a chant a little bit. Um, that's a good way to end it. But this is the this is the part of the meeting. Thank you all again. Uh, what do we do? Okay. So I want to direct your attention to the uh, white sheet, the, the first part of the agenda. So right now in the Iowa State House, uh, but there's a lot of bills, and it's hard to keep track of everything going on up there. I think that's by design so that it distract people, confuse them, make them feel like. What can I do and give up? But we're not giving up. We focused on two bills that we think need immediate action, or well, one that needs immediate action to become law, and then one that absolutely cannot become law. Uh, the first bill there is is a proposal, and actually this is a Republican-sponsored bill. It might have been just for show because it supposedly did not survive the first legislative funnel, but that doesn't matter to us, and it also doesn't matter to legislators out there, because if leadership wants to consider a bill, they can bring it up at any time while the legislature is in session. Yeah. That's why we have Senate leadership listed on this sheet. So that first bill would car out or remove the long-term services and supports population from privatized and managed Medicaid uh, and return them to state-run Medicaid. Uh, these are the population that Managed care organizations are about taking healthy people and keeping them healthy, and that's how they make their money. When you have people who will always need Medicaid services, that they always need those. So the managed care organizations are denying these people services. We want them removed. This has uh, actually like the all Democratic support, supposedly a little bit of Republican support. So. We're encouraging folks to email, call Majority Leader Bill Dix, Senate President Jack Whitmer, he's here in the metro area. <clears throat> Write a letter to the editor about these. Why are we not acting right now uh, to serve our most vulnerable? Or are they not are they not deserving? No, that's not the kind of Iowa values, right, that we live in. Um, now that next bill, this is very, very, very bad. It survived the legislative funnel. You know, some people might have been hearing about Medicaid work requirements. How many people have been hearing about that, either from the federal level or the state level? Well, this includes that. Um, it's much worse. The way that this bill reads, and it survived the funnel, it said that they will implement work requirements, drug testing, that they'll make the uh, Medicaid or SNAP recipient. SNAP is food stamps. Let's call them food stamps. That's what they used to be. Snap. Snap sounds cool though, but um, food stamps uh, or any form of public assistance. So they will make you pay for a quarterly, Bridget, is a quarterly drug test or is it yearly? 
Okay, they're gonna make you pay for it, and then if you pass your own drug test, then they'll put the money that you spent on your drug test into your benefits, but they won't give you that cash back. They also, this bill is trying to seek a waiver from the federal government, we all know who's in charge right now, um, to change the way the food stamp program is done. They want to uh, prohibit people from getting any food that is deemed low nutritional value, or they would not let you buy anything that would cost more than eight dollars a pound. So, because we all know everyone on food stamps is buying a lobster. So, this bill is very, 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 very bad. So again, we don't like this bill. Kill that bill. Write letters to the editor on that bill. Uh, contact your senator, your representative, but also contact leadership. Just because you don't live in their district, and maybe you do, I know there's so many, many folks here, but um, they represent the people of Iowa. They don't just represent the people in some boundary drawn on a map. So um, those are the, the pieces of legislation that we are focusing on because we feel they would have the most impact on the largest <coughs> population right now at the state house. So that's the immediate action. Also, um, you had mentioned in the back last about you know like how do we have a multi-pronged approach. Um, United Healthcare ain't treating people right right now. They aren't, especially the um, the ones that that were on Ameri Health Caritas and then got transitioned to a new United Health. They are not treating them right. So if anybody wants to board a bus and go find the nearest United Healthcare office, we're down. We love oh, doing yeah. that. We're the ones. And I'll be there to film it. There you go. <laughs> so last year, after David Young cast the decisive vote in the House to move the Affordable Care Act repeal to the Senate, he was the decisive vote. So on July 29th, we got on a bus and we went over to Van Meter and we wrote our health care stories and shoved them in prescription bottles and we left them on his front porch. So we are all about getting on a bus and confronting the people in power that make these decisions. Um, and so, and that's another reason why um, uh, that I want you to join the movement, join our movement. Uh, the movement that it takes. So if you're not a CCI action member, I'm asking you to join. Uh, more people means more power. As Michael said, the Republicans, they don't have a health care plan. They're just against everything. Yeah. Democrats need to be challenged to not just defend the status quo, but be for something. We are for something. We, are, we want to be that unstoppable movement that makes the politically uh, impossible, the politically inevitable. Um, so, Susie, why are you a member? Oh boy, I love telling you about this. <laughs> <laughs> this is the organization you want to belong to if you care. If you care to be better educated, if you care about what happens to 99% of the people in this state, this is where you want to be. They educate you, they help you have a stronger voice, and you have no fear of confronting power. Right. Yeah. And we take bus rides sometimes. Yeah. Behind Tom, Jack, hiding. Why are you a member? Uh, I grew up in a home where my mom worked two to three low wage jobs and didn't have enough money to afford health insurance. And until I got involved with CCI, I didn't feel like I was powerful enough to change things in my community to um, help my mom get the health insurance that she deserves, which is a right. But now that I went to CCI, I know that it is possible and we're going to make it happen. Thank you, Jack. So that's where this yellow sheet comes in. We are, we are going to be the ones that fund our own movement. It will take a movement. Um, and then also, you'll notice on, uh, on your uh, agenda that electoralize is in quotes. That's because Microsoft told me that that technically wasn't a word. I disagree. Sure. But we need to electoralize this issue. We need to demand what we want, what we deserve, and make sure our elected officials know that. So I think as Michael said that, um, let's stop talking about what we can't do, let's start talking about what we can and should do, and demanding that our elected officials and candidates running for office um, do that as well. So um, let me tell you something, this is, your political, moral beliefs aside, so we're not going to get into a discussion on this, but for an example, 
folks heard about or have been hearing about the fetal heartbeat bill at the state house. So people thought that, that was practically impossible, right? I mean, like they say, it's unconstitutional. Well, part of the strategy is to pass that, force a discussion at the U.S. Supreme Court, and overturn Roe versus Wade. So that didn't stop the faction pushing for that because people said, oh, you can't do that or it's unconstitutional. They did it because they're like, this is what we believe. And they pushed and it passed the Senate. So we've got to have that kind of political will and demand that from our elected officials. And, um, and I'll tell you that that is why CCI Action did endorse Kathy Glossop for governor because she... So right now, when we're in this crisis that we are in, it's not about, well, what's politically possible and what, what's going to appeal to you know, here? No, Kathy said what we needed. So do we believe that we deserve access to quality healthcare? Yeah. Yeah. Then let's demand it. And that's what Kathy is out there doing. So that's why CCI Action endorsed her. That's why National Nurses United endorsed her. That's why I'm asking folks, how many folks know if, if that's how you're voting on June 5th? And did you know that the primary is June 5th? So if not, please check her out. Check out her website. Um, and then vote on June 5th. And then demand of every, every elected official. Can you ask me, did you have something there? Yeah, well, I just want to say something, because she lined up with us on our issues, but she also lined up with us on our theory of change. That it's going to take. We talked about it all night. Michael talked about it. And you talked about it. Everybody says that we need a people power, mass based movement to create big change. Right. It's not about sending Kathy to Des Moines and you, or to the Capitol. You solve our problem. We stand with Kathy because she stands with us. We support her because she supports us. It's a right. people power movement to create big change. That's right. Yeah, we, we are our own saviors. There is no savior that we. Said it is us. So demand that of every single candidate. Um, so are we going to do this thing? Are we going to create the movement, build that movement? Yes. All right. All right. To get uh, you asked me. I got one other question. You were saying about you know sign up as a CCI action member. So I got this dilemma. I'm already a CCI action member. So what can I do? Can I make an extra gift? To well. You, yes you can, because I believe, um, I might have heard this from Hugh Espy actually, that Moses didn't go to Pharaoh and ask Pharaoh to fund their exodus. So we fund our own movement. So yes, we will, we will not turn you away if you want to contribute, it because we're building the movement. So tomorrow, Michael and I are going to drive in whatever weather there is, to Cedar Falls, and then over to Dubuque, and then we're going to go to Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, and we're going to do meetings all around there. Um, and then we're going to keep talking to people about this and build that movement. So uh, we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule. Do you, would you be willing to, to lead us in a chant? Yes, I would. All right, then let's end with a chant on high energy. Yeah. So um, we're also going to go, I think we're going to go up to Elkport, yes. where my great-great-grandfather is buried. So, uh, forward to that. Uh, yes, 40 miles north of Dubuque. So we have a slogan. Have you guys seen the sign? Love it, improve it, Medicare for all? Yeah. You guys see that? So we, have a, we made that into a chant. Love it, improve it, Medicare for all. Love it, improve it, Medicare for all. Love it, improve it, Medicare for all. Love it, improve it.